First of all, those who are watching the streaming, apologies, but you won't see the, um, the slides appearing for technical reasons. Um, Jason's attempting to uh, use the camera to pick up the detail, so apologies that it's not the same quality as the previous talk and hopefully the next talk. I think everyone knows John, if you're active on VHF or microwaves, you've almost certainly worked him on the air. Very well known, um, both on VHF and on microwaves, um, particularly in Europe where his contacts are legion. Um, key player in the UK microwave group. Don't think I need to say anything else. John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Graham. Well, I hope my voice holds out for this because I'm suffering a bit from a cold, so apologies if I get a bit croaky at any point. i talk about um, using um, Air Scout for aircraft scatter. That I'll get to a bit later on in the talk. I'll just do a little bit of um, intro to what aircraft scatter is about for um, uh, those that haven't thought about using it so far. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the basics and then we'll do some demos. So, first of all, you are probably familiar with what we call monostatic radar, which is a single transmitter, sends off a signal up to the plane, bounces back, and you turn the dish round or whatever it is, and you can get a plan position indication of where all the planes are around you. So, that's what most people think of as radar. But there is also this system, where you transmit from one station and receive at the other. Now, that's little used in practice in radar, except maybe in some military installations, but it's um, the way that we use radar transmissions, if you like, off, uh, to bounce signals off planes. We have a thing called radar cross-section that uh, defines how good a scatterer something is. So, a plane like a Boeing 737 would have a few square meters of radar cross-section. Uh, it's also very variable depending on which way the plane's oriented. Um, <coughs> things like stealth fighters, for example, are pretty much in, uh, very designed to have a very small uh, radar cross-section for signals that come in and go out at the same angle, but to mo what we talk, call monostatic radar. But a stealth plane might well still reflect quite a bit in bi-static case. So uh, the bigger the radar cross-section the better from our point of view and there are some occasions when you get what's called glint from a particular orientation of the plane where you get much bigger signals as a result. Um, you can also get a focusing effect from diffraction around the plane as well which can also cause similar sorts of uh, signal enhancements. So I like to think a lot of it's when the signals are loud are reflections, not scattering, uh, in my view, but I could be wrong. Um, Doppler shift. People often think there must be a lot of Doppler shift, but actually there needn't be. If um, a plane's travelling directly along the line between transmitter and receiver, there is none. Because as the path increases from one side, it decreases at the other by the same amount. So no change in path length no Doppler shift. So that's nice from our point of view. So planes that are travelling directly over the path or at a very slight angle, not much Doppler shift. This is why we don't use do Doppler uh, backscatter very much. You could in theory bounce signals off planes behind you, but it's tricky to do because the Doppler shift is quite large. And also, <coughs> the path losses are generally higher because you're going over a greater distance over the A1 path. So it's unlikely that you'd do that unless you can elevate the uh, <coughs> antenna at the B1 end, uh, the B end of the, of the path. So not much used. Um, if we look at, this is a very exaggerated thing. I don't think planes normally fly quite that high. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the geometry that if you can fire off at grazing incidence up here and grazing incidence at the other end with a particular height of plane that gives you a great circle distance and this graph here shows you um, what you can expect to achieve by aircraft reflections or aircraft scatter 
and you can see it tops out. Uh, this is normal commercial aircraft ceiling height, just around 40,000 feet, just about 900k, something of that sort. Now it can be more or less than that figure, depending on um, <coughs> the takeoff at each end of the path. So if you've got a station on a mountain top somewhere, they can actually see down, you know, effectively their horizon is below zero degrees. So this, this number can go up to a thousand K if you have a well sighted portable station on top of a mountain. But for most practical purposes, somewhere just short of 900 K is practical. So it's pretty good for working DX. Um, if you're trying to work short paths, you need to use fairly low planes unless you can elevate the antennas. Because if these guys are up here, you tend to, <coughs> tend to find that the antennas, uh, beam widths, can become a problem, particularly at microwaves. Um, yes, size does matter. Um, A380s, fantastic options if you uh, find them, but there aren't so many of them. And uh, the story is that there are not going to be so many of them in future. Um, the 747, 757s, um, MD-11s, things like that are pretty good. These fellows here are what you will find lots and lots of. These are the EasyJets and the uh, Ryanairs of this world. Um, they're buzzing around all over Europe all the time. And that's generally speaking what you're going to get in terms of good reflections. There's then another category of smaller aircraft below that. Some of them work, some of them don't. <laughs> Things like uh, the Embraer's uh, regional jets uh, can be used, but the aircraft reflections diminish, and uh, Cessna size stations and things like that tend to be a bit too small. So, generally speaking, these are the workhorses of aircraft reflection. If you find those, great, because you'll get some good signals from them. Um, most of the plotters actually show the relative sizes of the aircraft, so you can see what uh, you're uh, trying to use. In terms of the bands, anywhere from 70 megs, possibly even 50, up to 24 gigs. The higher you go, the more critical uh, the path becomes in terms of angles of uh, pointing. So you've got to use elevation, potentially, if you want to do it at high frequencies. And the usable time for the reflections goes down. So. Generally, sweet spot is around 23 SEMs. Um, that's probably about the best band in my experience for it. Um, <coughs> in terms of the modes, at the moment it's mostly on CW and SSB. A lot of contacts that people make on SSB where they work the odd piece of DX is actually aircraft scattered by random reflection rather than tropo. Certainly if it's uh, somewhere around, say, five or 600 kilometers. The JT modes um, are starting to get more popular. So the ones that are applicable here are things like the ISCAT A and B. Uh, JT9F looks like it's a good candidate as well in the JT9F fast modes. Um, it, they're being used and um, things like the DigiFest, which I think John's going to talk about, uh, is an opportunity to try some of these things out. And, uh, but not in use by too many stations just yet. So the, the real, most of the real DX is CW uh, on, that's being worked on this. Um, short periods, you've only got a limited amount of time to make the contact. So um, one minute periods in each direction, or in practice more often now, uh, the better equipped station calls with short calls and listens and waits for the signal to come up from the far end. Now you can do it yourself if you have your own ADSB receiver. Um, there used to be uh, receivers like the SBS mode, SB fun cube dongles with suitable software and antennas. Problem is you can only see the aircraft near to you. You can't see the ones near the other end of the path. So you can see stuff out to maybe 400k if you really 
have a good system but you can't see the stuff that's coming towards you which will be good in about a minute two minutes time when it gets to the 400k mark so using the internet based virtual radar plotters is uh, more use, used these days you've got lots of um, coverage from lots of receivers scattered around Europe and the world there can be some holes and some of these um, uh, only give you a certain limited amount of time unless you actually subscribe to their services so if they're a little bit fiddly to use so there are now specialized tools available which make it a lot easier to do the first versions were <coughs> using the existing radar websites and overlays to uh, say where the best reflections were, were um, using plane finder and a thing called AC Grid Vista, which allowed you to overlay another um, <coughs> set of coordinates on top with a transparent view through to the bottom on the on PC screen. However, there are now custom aircraft scatter programs, and I'm going to concentrate today on this one. The um, aircraft scatter sharp is a uh, one by um, Roger Rain, W3SZ, um, and it has some disadvantages it's nice if you want to build a database of all the planes that cross a certain path but it's um, it has some limitations and uh, I used this one for a while um, 906WW's program but it's not supported and it's not really available these days the bottom one is available is supported and is working quite well um, so that's basically where we were with aircraft scatter sharp um, it has some advantages as I say in terms of um, being able to do things like expected signal levels and uh, it'll even predict uh, tropo scatter as well and line of sight if we uh, you know, <coughs> problem with this one is that there's no aircraft height or size filter it looks like there's lots of planes in the right place here they're all on the ground <laughs> um, so that's less than useful uh, this one uh, program was very nice and it had rain scatter and aircraft scatter in one program which is very nice and um, it's but as I say it's sort of fallen out of use and, and some of the links don't work and it comes up with warnings and it's not really very usable these days so if we go to Air Scout, um, it takes data from a virtual radar site but makes its own plots and overlays from that and it shows you the picture of the reflection zone in the vertical plane so you can see where the plane's going in the height dimension as well and color codes the planes and gives you a point of time to the intercept point for each plane and it also knows all about terrain so it'll do block it, you know, the effects of blocking locally or enhanced horizon distance and it can do Fresnel zone effects as well but that's actually a double-edged sword that one I'll come back to that later on um, so when you're using this you type in a call sign and it fills in the locator that it knows about you might have to retype it if it's moved so it knows where the, where the stations are and it automatically recenters the whole path plot when you change the wanted stations you can capture cre screenshots uh, so if you want to record what uh, it looked like the um, little snag with this is that uh, the open source plane feed is sometimes a little bit unreliable it seems better in the last few weeks but previous to that you'd follow the planes tracking across the map and then suddenly they go and then they start to track forward again and you weren't quite sure whether it was going to cross the path then or then you know, it's, uh, so it uh, was a little unreliable but it seems to have been improved in the last few weeks so I haven't noticed that happening uh, recently but you also have to be aware that there are a few apparent holes in coverage and if people switch their receivers off when they go to bed then coverage starts to diminish a bit after bedtime <laughs> so uh, there we go so that's air scout 
Um, what I'll do now, actually, I'll just go back here and um, I'll put Air Scout up. We'll, we'll do it a different way. I'll just uh, take you through some example uh, <coughs> contacts. So this one is, these next two are on CW. Yeah, doesn't like that either. Um, not quite sure why it's uh, misbehaving. <laughs> yes, I heard that. <laughs> Let's try this one, see if that's any different. Right, this is S uh, OK2M. This is recorder that OK2M ends of the contact. interesting towards the end the signals really came up and that was when the plane actually provided what we call glint on the signal so very short duration maybe a few seconds but the signals were very quite really quite loud for a while John what band was that that's 23 cents thank you and uh, that's over a path distance of about 960k so it's about as far as you can do mm -hmm. uh, you'd think that might be quite rare but I just <coughs> randomly the other day switched on Air Scout and put OK2, well OK7M, it's the same location in here, and there's an A380 crossing the uh, path. <laughs> <laughs> so it happens even on those very long paths. You can see that the reflection point that we can both see is actually quite short, just in this bit here. And you can see it's hit on here. There's the um, uh, limitation of uh, where uh, 12,000 blue line is about the limit of uh, visibility of planes and you can see there's just a very small space where we, we can get reflections um, right if I just uh, go back a step excuse me um, let's see if this one works <laughs> it should uh Just need to get connected to the internet on this.
<laughs> Lovely. Oh dear. Yeah. Just uh, QRX a moment whilst I uh, get this. I think you should have worked for BT, John. Uh, I should. All right. That one there. Uh, no, oh, no, that one, yeah. One yeah, that one. Yeah. That's it. Right. Let's try that again then. <laughs> right. Right, so this is a video shot by uh, uh, DL2ALF. This is SSB this time. That one's too low by a long way. This is going to be a relatively short path. Good evening, Charlie. Your 5 Yeah, and uh, to do the 13 sem one, then we would have uh, had to wait it for another plane. So let's just see if this one's working yet. Yeah. No, what's happened to that one? But uh, gives you some idea of the uh, of uh, what aircraft scatter contact look like, and it, you can correlate it pretty well with where the plane is. So what I'm going to do now is actually uh, go to Air Scout itself and show you uh, that in practice. So this is uh, the Air Scout screen. You can download the software. I'll put the link up later on for you, and you can put in the call sign of the station that you want to uh, contact. So just happened to have G7RAU in his new location on the Lizard in there. And you can see that uh, you know, there are several planes. The ones in purple are the ones that are immediately in uh, uh, contention for reflecting signals. The red ones are going to cross the path. So there's plenty of opportunity on that path for aircraft scattering. That's about 500 kilometres, that one. And so you can if you have three planes all appear at the same time, could you get multiple reflections? Well, you do, and they interfere with each other as well, so you get oh, right. QSB and all sorts yeah. of effects, potentially. But um, it's, uh, I, I, I rarely do you actually see any huge enhancement from having lots of planes. It's just a sort of random effect. So that's... Um, uh, we've got pretty good visibility. There's a big area, if you look in this purple patch, in vertical plane so uh, we can see planes down to about 4,000 meters in the middle of the path which is around about there so if we just uh, choose something a bit further away we we had uh, DL0 GTH on there so that's, uh, Could you get reflections off a military aircraft, which you wouldn't over be there? Uh, yes, uh, some of them do show up on radar and some don't. 
Um, so you can get reflections that appear which don't correlate with planes on here, which are planes that don't have ADSB. There are still some of those, and uh, military stuff that's not using them. So as you can see, just at the moment, there's not that much happening, but there are a few, quite a few red planes. There's something reasonably large there. If you actually move the mouse over the planes, you can see it'll tell you what that plane is. If I get it in the right place. Uh, briefly, but if I press the button, it will tell you. And now it's, it's actually showing you where it's going to cross the path. So it's actually uh, crossing nearly the middle of the path. And it's a McDonald's book, well, it's MD11, that one. But it's actually only 258 metres above the path, minimum path height. At some point, John, are you going to, I'd like the bottom part to explain a bit more. Right, okay. This bit here? Yeah. Right. Um, this is the terrain profile at the bottom. It's a different scale from this top half. So that's, the, that's uh, um, in thousands of metres up there. This is in hundreds, uh, well, ten, yes, hundreds of metres for the path profile. You can see there on top of a mountain with a reasonably good horizon. That's me with a tiny little horizon over there and a lot of sea and Netherlands and things in the way. Um, Does it self-scale? It self-scales if this is up to, say, 5,000 metres, then this will scale differently under those circumstances. Uh, this tends to be 0 to 20,000 metres, pretty much under any circumstances. So the purple bit in the middle here is the mutually visible area that you can see from that location. So we can see planes down to a height of around about <coughs> five or six thousand metres in the middle of the path. Could you both beam offline to a particular plane? You can do. <coughs> uh, yes, it's possible to do that. Um, it tends to not work quite as well as a reflector or uh, if you're out of line. So... Uh, most people just beam directly at it, but there's a guy in Germany with a big three metre dish, DJ5AR, who uh, does try offline working and it will work, but you need to, and he uses elevation as well with his dish, and uh, that works very nicely, but you need to have good uh, control systems. There is actually a software controller in this for controlling the rotator. So if I um, go in options here, uh, tracking, then you can actually make it track directly from the program into your rotator if you've got it connected up to the program. So it's uh, you know, <coughs> nice features in there. We've got uh, Mike GATIC on the chat for the forum enjoying the talk along with many others. Um, he's just saying that all UK military do use ADSB, but they change the codes every month so that nobody can build a meaningful database yeah. of what ID the aircraft are. So they do use. I've it. seen some very interesting IDs yeah. on some of these planes that obviously are military ones. Um, so I've seen F-15s and things like that for, over the North Sea with uh, <coughs> very strange-looking ADSB uh, identifiers. But yes. Uh, so hopefully you do see most of those military planes. I expect there are a few that uh, travel incognito. <laughs> so um, it, did that answer your question? That's the question that I guess I ought to uh, ask yes. about that. Right. Um, the other thing that um, yeah, is uh, apparent in here, if you look up in this top corner here, there's a thing called band. Well, I've got 10G set up now. now I'll just show you uh, what the effect is on this on if I do a very long path. If I look for, if I type SK7MW in there. Close. Close. <laughs> right. Yeah, you have to remember to uh, switch, press the pause button. Right. Um, you can see there's a a usable but quite small path that we can operate, um, work on that one. Not that many planes about that are going to cover it. All the grey ones are of no interest at all. 
the yellow one or the orange one down here is a plane that's going to cross the right area but it's too low so you need a red one which is going to but but um, if a plane flies directly along the line but is just say to the left of it and is going that away it never shows up as as um, uh, red until it actually gets into or, or, or orange or purple until it actually gets into the zone because it doesn't have a sufficiently clever algorithm in the program at the moment to actually say that there's actually a circle round here that it could cross that would make it useful for reflections it's only if it crosses the path itself that it uh, shows up as highlighted so there are if you can see a plane coming along in either direction this way almost exactly on the path even if it's gray it might still be usable you have to check the altitude and see just how good uh, it might be well I can move it I can move the path around on the screen like that if you mean uh, yeah, no, I mean oh you mean up and down yeah, yeah, uh, just, you, just you can you can actually you can actually do that hmm. but it's not uh, you have to zoom in quite a long way to make it workable yeah. to do it, but you can do it. I understand the Russians can actually move the plane. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I change the band on this, you'll see an interesting effect. I'll just have to pause it again while we do that. If I move that down to, say, 432 megs, watch what happens. It disappears. And that's because the program's taking into account these Fresnel effects, and it thinks that the path might be too obstructed on 70 sems, but in practice, in my view, it doesn't actually seem to work quite that way because I can work SK7NW on 70 sems pretty well any time we have a contest. So it's, um, <coughs> it's not actually... Uh, it tends to give very pessimistic results if you set the band to the right band, and I usually leave it on 10G. And then you get something like the bright, right sort of answers. Was so there is, it's ever so oh, tiny. It's so, small, it's so small you can hardly oh, see it, okay. but there is just a tiny purple bit in the middle. There. But it's a, it is quite a short path. And uh, what we have to do is sit there looking at the screen, waiting for a plane to appear that might do some good. It's a, it's a little bit tricky sometimes to find uh, planes. But on the other hand, um, if I type this call sign in, there almost certainly will be planes. As you can see, there's a great big one just at the moment. Um, and this is uh, DF9IC down in JN48 Square. And uh, he's workable pretty well all the time. Even if I don't look at this, there'll be a plane crossing the path because it's in a... Uh, a zone of very high air traffic going down across Belgium uh, and into that part of Germany there. The only time it doesn't work was when they had the Iceland volcanoes <laughs> and all the planes disappeared. So uh, that gives you some idea about that one. Um, you, as I showed you before, you can put your uh, uh, the um, cursor on the planes and click. if you click on it, it shows it... Uh, where it's going to cross the path. That plane will turn to purple sometime in the next minute as it gets closer. It turns purple when that distance goes down to 10 kilometers and it will show purple until it's 10k out of the other side. So basically it's showing you a scatter zone of about 10 kilometers either side, which in practice seems about right. <coughs> it seems to work about right, does that? So, um, I think at this point I'd uh, probably stop and ask for any questions because uh, I've probably rabbited on long enough. John, do you run, do you work split for this so you can follow the doctor? No, uh, generally speaking, if the plane's crossing at that sort of angle, even on 23 sems, the, the Doppler's quite low, 100 hertz, 200 hertz. Mm. Even if it was crossing directly across the path like that, it'd be less than 500 hertz at 23 sems. So it's not really too much of a problem. And the high bands, 
Higher bands, yes, the Doppler increases in proportion to frequency. So by the time you get to 10 gigs, Doppler is quite significant. Uh, you can put beacons in. Um, you can add anything you like to the database, basically. So I've probably got um, in here things like GB3A and G, for example, with a bit of luck. Uh, uh, too many fingers. There it is. And again, you can see that you get pretty good reflections from GB3 A and G down here through those planes crossing that path. So it's possible to work out to, say, yeah, as I say, eight, nine hundred kilometres from a reasonable site, or almost any day of the week, just using aircraft scatters. Any more questions? Just to reinforce what you're saying about our backs, it's my observation from the Midlands to the Beacon from here is that if you try and track off the direct line, you just don't get anything useful at all. So it is very much that direct path. Mm. Yes, yes, it seems to be that way. Um, the other thing is that if you're doing it over relatively short distances, you actually need to consider elevation as well. Uh, one thing I can do on here is set the options to show elevation, I think, if I get this right. Um, that was a question of finding the right bit of the... Uh, yes, yeah, one of these. <laughs> Well, the other thing this does is uh, allows you to do radio horizon. So I can do radio horizon plot based on the uh, database of height information it's got. So this uh, tells me what my horizon angle is and distance I can see to the horizon. So it's plotting it using what's called SRTM3 data, which is pretty high resolution data. John, could we uh, come together and buy GCH one of Sam's preamps for 2022? <laughs> 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 I find it very deaf at times. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Problem they have in that part of the world is QRM. Yeah, on 23. Mm, really? Even on 23. Really? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, it's very highly densely populated, yeah. um, and uh, having arguments about who owns what frequency over there on twenty three seventh Street, Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. That's my frequency. You know, it's my frequency. I've been on for ten minutes, and why was trying to disappear? Yeah. So you can see this from my path profile that the good direction is out to the east to southeast, and the bad one is to the northwest. tried looking on say a waterfall on say something like WSJT9 mm -hmm. um, say on a beacon and you just get the straight line no Doppler and you also see aircraft scatter with you, you trails see, coming across yeah. at an angle or a yeah. curve or whatever yes that's right and that's yeah. quite interesting just to look at yeah yeah I've done that uh, quite a bit in the past mm -hmm. you, yes the ones that are going across at an angle are generally going to be the the planes that are crossing the path, mm -hmm. because they're the ones that create the most Doppler effect. So yes. um, that's not quite suitable really to demonstrate that on, but uh, if I put um, one of the other ones back up. So yeah, if we looked at that plane, for example, then that one would exhibit quite a lot of Doppler effect because it's, uh, logged onto the wrong plane, but mm -hmm. that one is going to uh, cross at right angles, which maximises the amount of Doppler mm -hmm. on that one. But you'll have a relatively short reflection. What you really want, of course, are planes that travel directly up and down this line. And if you can find those, then you can get reflections that last 15 minutes. And this one here, for example, you can see, look at that plane there, then Potentially, that's going to be in range for 
and it probably has been in range since about here and up to there. So you're talking about ten, tens of minutes potentially of uh, aircraft scattered. Okay, any more questions? Um, yeah, you know, you have a slide up there with, um, with the aircraft which are grounded. How do you filter those out? Uh, there's a, a, the filtering is here, uh, just on the right hand side. Let me just uh, show you that. You if you look, ones you so you can set a minimum altitude in this box. I'll set it to 5,000 meters. Okay. Um, the thing that catches you out is planes that don't reset their altimeters and they're parked on the ground and still showing 10,000 meters. <laughs> and there's a few of those, I don't know quite what they're doing, but they, then they sort of sit at an airport and show you that the time to intercept with your path, although they're shown in red, is 355 minutes and things like that. So you can tell they're not moving anywhere, but I don't quite understand why they... Uh, as soon as they land, they're supposed to turn the loadless transponder off. You, mm, obviously standard, are, <laughs> standard practice. Yeah, obviously, some don't. So, there we go. John, you were going to show us the download link. Sorry? You said something about showing us the oh, download yes. link. Yeah, let me just uh, <coughs> escape from this one. Wait for it to close. Each time we'll do that instead. So, um, yes, yeah, so I managed to uh, change it to shortcut LNK, which isn't very mm. useful. Um, if I just go back to the internet for a minute, if you type in air scout into Google. then you get all of those, but you should also get the right thing in the moment. Okay. So it's airscout.eu, and uh, if you look in downloads, it's got a, a manual in English, and then the main software is there. So it's currently 1205. I think there is a new version on the way from comments I've seen, but it uh, doesn't seem to have appeared as yet. So you have to keep an eye on from time to time to see if it's been updated. So, um, John, one of the issues is, is the actual data feeds into an air scout um, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, being there all the time for sometimes legal reasons. Yeah, the thing to do uh, is that it, that has largely been solved now by um, if I just um, back up again, there's a thing called Virtual Radar Site, which um, uh, is a public domain uh, uh, database, uh, well, public domain tracker system, which actually will license uh, other people to use, uh, gives a free license for other people to use the data. So it's not constrained by um, copyright issues, which uh, were a, a real concern with some of the previous trackers. So if you go in the options on here, um, you can choose where you get the data from. Um, <coughs> that wrong one. Planes. Planes, yeah. Uh, so at the moment I'm using this thing called Virtual Radar Server, and that works fine uh, at the moment. <laughs> There were, certainly were problems in the past when using things like Plane Finder uh, because of these problems over copyright and then changing the format of the feed, but uh, it seems to be okay with virtual radar service.